ascension, and now we go back into the, the regular Psalms, and uh, this Psalm speaks about God's people praising Him, and so the psalmist here encourages us to praise the Lord as we just did. And of course, praising the Lord is in our everyday life. Our conduct reveals the Lord and who we are and, and how we act. It brings praise to the Lord as well. So he starts by saying, praise the Lord. Who knows what that is in Hebrew? Anyone? Ha. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> you got it. I knew you knew it. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah is the way it starts. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise Him, all you servants of the Lord, you who stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praises to His name, for He is pleasant. So what do you think the psalmist is trying to communicate there? Praise the Lord, right? Sing unto the Lord. Worship the Lord. Honor the Lord. And he says, all you servants of the Lord, praise the Lord. That's everyone. Everyone's considered a servant of the Lord. And then he says, uh, where is it at? Let me think. Uh, praise the Lord. Uh, is that in the house of the Lord or in the court of the Lord? In the house of the Lord speaks to the Levites and the, uh, the priests. They are the only ones allowed in the house of the Lord or in the temple of the Lord. In the courts of the Lord are everyone else outside of those who are in the service of the Lord. And so the idea is that we're all to worship the Lord, every, every one of us. And then he says, for the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel for his special people. And so, of course, through Jacob was the promise of the Messiah, who is our salvation. And so... Uh, God did make a, a plan and a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and also with Jacob about the plan of salvation coming through the line of them. And so he says, you know, praise the Lord for that. And then he says, for Israel is a special treasure. Uh, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, Peter wrote, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and then it says, His own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who, has not, who have not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy mercy so with with Israel he says you're a special treasure and then with Peter he says we are a special people and I like the way Peter wrote about this and as the Lord or the Holy Spirit directed him he says you're a, you're his own special people and then he says one of the reasons for that is so that you can proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness you know the last couple of months it seemed like we've been coming across this subject of darkness. We've gone over it a couple of times. I'm not going to go over it tonight, but it's just interesting that the Lord has been reminding us of where we came from and what He brought us out of. And He's going to talk about that in these Psalms as well as we get into the Egypt part of it. And so He brought us out of darkness into His marvelous light. You know, it's uh, it's interesting that the Lord is the only one that can bring us out of darkness. You know, we can try to convince people, talk to people, help them see who the Lord is. But unless the Lord does it, they will never come out of darkness. They will always be in the fog, always be in the shadow of things. And, you know, the Lord has to open their eyes to the truth as He did us. You know, people talk to us, people try to get us to church, people try to trick us. Uh, I remember, I don't even know who, way back, way, I think it was Don McClure or someone, Back when we were in Torrance talking about, you know, there's a wife that got the toilet paper and she rolled it down and put these scriptures on it and rolled it up, put scripture. So when her husband went to the restaurant as he pulled the toilet paper, he would see these <laughs> verses trying to get him to save. I mean, she was serious about trying to get him to hear the word of God. And you know what? The Lord calls us out of darkness. He says, who, who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who were once not a people, when we're not walking with the Lord, we are not His people, but are now the people of God who has, who have not obtained mercy, so we didn't have the mercy of God, but now you have obtained 
the mercy of God. So Peter tells us another way why we're special people in the Lord. He has a plan for us. We are chosen of God as a special people for Him, and we're chosen to praise Him. That's another key in these first four verses. For I know that the Lord is great, and our Lord is above all God. So the psalmist here has his confidence in God, but says, you know what, I know. Okay, not something he's thinking about or wondering or hoping. He says, I know that the Lord is great. I mean, most of the time we know the Lord is great. But when troubles come and heartaches come, we begin to doubt that greatness because we don't see things go on our way. Believe me, yeah, I'm bad for that. I start forgetting how big God is. And I think the song we just, one of the songs we sang is, you know, our worries bring God out of focus. He becomes small. When really he's way bigger than our problems, but our problems become large and we, we don't see God. And it's true. That happens to us. That's what we do. But he says, for I know that the Lord is great and our Lord is above all God. What gods? The gods of this world. The gods that, the false god the, that men worship, you know. Uh, today in our culture, uh, we don't really worship statues. And stuff like they did in the Old Testament and even with, within the New Testament uh, early days but you know we worship other things like wealth employment uh, cars houses jobs relationships you know people worship a lot of stuff uh, and and he says, I know the Lord is great, and our God is above all God. So whatever God that might be out there, God is bigger. God is, is the one true God. Whatever the Lord pleases, He does. Why? Because He's the creator of all things. It all belongs to Him. He's entitled to do what He wants with what He does. So whatever the Lord pleases, He does in heaven and in earth, in the sea and in all the deep places. So in other words, God is in charge of everything. There's nothing he's not involved with. He's in charge of everything. He causes the vapors or mist to ascend from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain. He brings the wind out of his treasury. So you can see that, that God is in control of the elements of this world. He brings the rain. He causes the mist to go up and come down. He says here, uh, he brings lightning for the rain. So when you hear the lightning, you know it's going to rain pretty soon. Uh, he's in charge of it all. Then he says, He destroyed the firstborn of Egypt, both the man and beast. He sent signs and wonders into the midst of you, O Egypt, upon Pharaoh and all his servants. He defeated many nations and slew mighty kings. So let me back up a minute. So, you know, what's, what he doesn't tell us is about the bondage during Egypt. We know about the Egypt, right? We all know about the story of Moses. We all know about the Hebrew people that went there with Joseph when Joseph first went there and they were kind of blessed by Pharaoh, the first Pharaoh, and and were herding the cattle and stuff out in Goshen and you know that whole thing. And then as time went over, you know, several hundred years passed by, the new Pharaoh and stuff uh, didn't like what he was seeing. They were getting too big and then he be then they became their slaves and they were involved in building all the structures within Egypt. And he don't talk about that. He just starts with the deliverance of Egypt. He said he destroyed the firstborn. Remember that was the 10th plague. The 10th plague was the plague of, of killing the firstborn of every family and of every animal. And so that's where he starts at, with about deliverance. And so he says uh, he destroyed the firstborn of Egypt, both of man and beast. He sent signs and wonders into the midst of you, O Egypt, upon Pharaoh and all his servants. So, of course, the ten plagues were all signs to warn him. He defeated many nations and slew mighty kings. This is when they were coming through on their way to the promised land. They, were, they had these battles, and they fought, and the Lord brought them victory. And so he defeated many nations and slew many kings. Sihon, the king of the Amorites. All the king of Bashan and all the kingdoms of Canaan. So again, as they were coming through, uh, they were fighting these battles. And one of the ones that I always remember is Og, king of Bashan, because Og was somewhere between 10 and 12 feet tall. We know because his bed is uh, 9 cubits by uh, 
four cubits. So it's, that's roughly 12 feet by six feet. So think of a bed 12. This stage here is 12 feet, and then six feet's about right here. So that's how big the bed was. So he was a big guy. Now laying down, you don't see it. So this ceiling is eight feet. Add four more feet. So if you're looking up, Og is up there somewhere in the rafters. So he's a big guy. And he says he king, uh, Og king of Bashan. So he slew these kings and fought them. And uh, it's always been said, no matter what's big in our life, doesn't matter how big it is, God is bigger. God can slay anything that comes our way. Uh, it's just that we have to remember that because we tend to forget. Again, they're too big. They, they can overwhelm us. But, you know, this psalm is a reminder of, of why we praise God. And gave their land as a heritage, a heritage to Israel, his people. How long did that take? 40 years. From the time they came out of Egypt, remember? 40 years before they would actually go in there. And so all these battles, God had taken them through. He says, your name, O Lord, endures forever. Your fame, O Lord, throughout all generations. For the Lord will judge his people and he will have compassion on his servants. The idol of the nations are silver and gold, the works of man's hands. And, uh, and men often worship what they create or build themselves. Man-made idols, man-made gods. Um, again, building houses. Uh, uh, the God of Moab, pleasure. The God of Astarte, uh, the sexual God, or the God of sexual pleasure. The God of mammon, power and money. These are the gods today. We just don't call them mammon and Artertes and, and Moab, but these are the gods today that people are, are involved with and they just don't know it because people are, uh, the God of Moab is interesting because this is the God of pleasure. It's, it's uh, building what we build and so uh, what we see today with pleasure, of course there's sexual pleasure, but then there's the uh, not so sinful pleasure, but it's simple because if all of our attention goes into our houses and that's what we do all day and we never give God a mind, then that becomes our God. And there are people like that, that their house is their God. It's, they're very well manicured and everything looks great. And I'm not saying we should have ugly houses by no means. Our houses ought to you know, represent our values and who we believe. But people can get carried away and spend all their time and do nothing for the Lord. And so uh, I think we need to be careful with that. But there are these gods that are out there. Moab, I think, is one of the, the ones of our time today because of uh, everybody wanting the nicer car, the more expensive car, and the bigger house, and all these pleasures of Moab, you know. So we got to be careful. He says, and then he says, these gods that you have you have made, because these these gods are the idols of gold and silver, or silver and gold. He says they have mouths, but they do not speak. They have eyes, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Nor is there any breath in their mouths. So these gods that are made by man, they're not really alive. They can't speak. They can't see. They can't hear. You know. Uh, now, some people want them. I mean, I remember growing up in the in the 70s, late 60s and 70s as a, a teenager, and you know, your car you call Betsy or whatever you want to name your car, and it, you were out of gas in the gas, come on, Betsy, you can make it, man, you can make it, and you're talking to that car to get you to that gas station. You, you know you're running on fumes. You remember, you remember that? I, I know it's... The newer generation doesn't remember that. But this older generation, we lived on prayer, and we didn't even have a relationship with that. We prayed to that car, man. Get me to that gas station, you know. And, and uh, But they can't talk back. They can't hear. They can't smell. They can't talk. They're not alive. They have no spirit or soul in them. You know, they're, they're man-made objects. And, and so he says, you know what? These gods that you worship, they're not real. The God of Abraham is real. He says, so those who make them, notice this verse 18. Those who make them are like them. 
And so is everyone who trusts in them. So, so think about this statement for a minute. Those who make them are like them, and so is everyone who trusts in them. So a person that trusts is in his man-made God, whether it's money, house, whatever, he says, you become like them. You, you can't speak because they can't speak. You can't see because they can't see. You can't hear because they don't hear. So, uh, you know, the world is blind to the things of God because the gods they worship, they become like. That's a, it's an interesting verse. You become like the very God you are and desire. And then he ends this song not by praise. Well, he ends it by praise, but he says in verse 19, Bless the Lord, O house of Israel. Bless the Lord, O house of Aaron, the, the line of the priests. Bless the Lord, O house of Levi. You who fear the Lord, that would be all of us. Bless the Lord. Bless, blessed be the Lord out of Zion, out of you know Jerusalem, Mount Moriah, or the place of the temple, who dwells in Jerusalem. So five times he says, bless the Lord. The first four verses, five times he said, praise the Lord. Now he says, bless the Lord. And then he ends the same way he started, by saying, hallelujah, praise the Lord. You know, he finishes the way he started. So he, this psalm tells us we're to praise the Lord, and then we're and then to bless the Lord. Psalm 136 is the song of thanksgiving uh, for God's mercy. It's called, and I just learned this, the antiphonal song, meaning it's a, a song of alternation. And so uh, I always remember in, in South Bay when Pastor Steve went through this, uh, we actually did this. So I'm going to have you guys do this. So, and what it is, is they believe, okay, it's not so much proven, but this has been the historical. Uh, teaching for since I mean I heard it when I was a brand new Christian the priest would read like the first part and then the people would be read for his mercy endures forever so I'm gonna read the first part all the way 26 verses and I want you guys to respond with for his mercy endures forever you got it okay. well, let, let's try it oh give thanks to the Lord for he is good Oh, give thanks to the God of gods. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, our Lord. To him who alone does great wonders. To him whom by wisdom made the heavens. To him who laid out the earth above the waters. To him who made great lights, the sun to rule by day, the moon and stars to rule by night, to him who struck Egypt in their firstborn, and brought out Israel from among them. With a strong hand and with an outstretched arm. To him who divided the Red Sea in two. And made Israel pass through the midst of it. But overthrew Pharaoh and his army in the Red Sea. To him who led his people through the wilderness. To him who struck down great kings and slew famous kings, Sihon, king of the Amorites, and Og, king of Bashan, and gave their land as a heritage, a heritage to Israel, his servant. Who remembers us in our lonely state and rescued us from our enemies? Who gives food to all flesh? Oh, give thanks to the God of heaven. So, what do you think the Lord was trying to teach them? 
His mercy endures forever. Right? You think you got it? You think they got it? Right? I mean, 26 times he said, the priest says, and the people respond. What do you think God's trying to communicate? His mercy endures forever. The first nine verses are all about his creation and praising God for everything that he's done and everything he's created and, and provided. And, and, you know, he's given us the sun, he's given us the moon, he's given us lights, the earth. He gave us wisdom and he does great wonders. And, and, and so, you know, all this first part is about. <coughs> Everything God has done, and so His mercy endures forever, and we are to be thankful for all that we have. Verses 10 through 15, you know, I wrote for my notes that the God who delivered Israel from bondage, He provided the way out and the path to take them from. So in, in 10, He struck Egypt and the firstborn, and He brought out Egypt from among them, and with a strong hand and outstretched outstretch arm he he ruled he divided the red sea when they had to get across the sea god opened it up with his nostrils and he made israel pass through it and he overthrew pharaoh and his army when they came after him in the red sea remember they they got through and pharaoh comes and they see it open they think they can go through and god lets go of the water they all they flooded them and they died and every one of them and so verses 10 through 15 is about God delivering them in the and and even though they were being uh, persecuted or or chased after he provided safety for them he didn't let the enemy come in and take them again and so you know we can trust God for all he's done and yes there might be times when we are uh, escaping areas but you know God's going to make a way and he'll he'll take he's got our back I guess that's what I want to say. He's got our back. You know, they're going this way. Pharaoh's coming behind them, and God has their back. But remember what happened before he opened that, that Red Sea. Where was Moses? Right up against the wall, right? The, the water was behind him. Pharaoh's coming this way. The, there's about a million or two people, two million in the area there, and they got nowhere to go. Totally nowhere to go. And sometimes God puts us in a box well, we got nowhere to go. And what do you do when you got nowhere to go? You got to look up. It's what builders do today. When there's no more land to build this way, they go up. And we have to go up. We have to look up. And Moses looked up and talked to God. And God said, raise your staff. And then he parts the Red Sea and gives a way of escape for them. So God, God provides it even at the last minute. How many times have you seen God do it at the last minute? <laughs> Crazy, right? Why does he do that? I don't know. I think he wants to drive me crazy. You know, it's like, okay, they're coming, they're coming, and there's that cliff, and I can't go no more. And dear God, help. Well, I've bought time. I had to get you to that cliff for you to turn around and say, help. Did you keep trying to do it your own way? No, God, he does that to us. Verses 16 to 25 is we give God praise because he keeps his promises he brought them through the wilderness he, wilderness he told me he was going to take them to the land of milk and honey he struck down all the obstacles in their way all the kings and and those you know Og of Bashan Sihon king of Amorite he 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 took care of all their uh, obstacles that were trying to hinder them from getting to where they were supposed to be because God gave them that land as a heritage, we're told in verse 21 and 22. God is the one who rescued them from their enemies. In verse 25, he says, he gives food to all flesh. You know, there in the wilderness, there was no food. The armies they destroyed, they destroyed the crops. And yet God provided water, he provided manna. He provided everything that they needed. Because he's the God who provides. And even when you think you got nothing, he'll make a way of providing what we need. That's why we're always told, never trust in your money. Trust in God. God, God has a way of providing. So he ends by saying, oh, give thanks to the God of heaven for his mercy endures forever. And, you know, we can depend upon God. God's mercy is always available. 26 times they have to say, for his mercy endures forever. 26 verses that speak to us of all that God is. And so, you know, it doesn't matter what we've done. 
or even what we're doing in the present sense, if we will repent and call upon God, He'll always give us the mercy we need to get past whatever it is we might go on. And, and I'm going to say this, and maybe this is for somebody that's here tonight. If you are hanging on to your past with something with unforgiveness, and I mean for yourself, then what you're saying is God's mercy is not enduring forever. God's mercy is available always. And in our terms, 24 hours a day, 365 days plus whatever every year. There's nothing we cannot be forgiven from if he has if we have repented. That's his promise. First John 1 9. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you your sins and cleanse you, he says, from all unrighteousness. If we don't accept that promise, then we're saying, God, you're a liar. You're, you're not true. If we accept it, then we're saying, we believe you, and I trust you, and I'm just going to move forward. Don't let the devil rob you of the mercy of God. That's what I want you to think about. Chapter 137 is longing for Zion from a foreign land. This is an interesting uh, chapter. It's only nine verses. It's about Israel as when they were taken away into Babylon and they were looking from a distance to what they had lost. Why did they, why were they taken to such a far way? You remember why they, they left or were taken in bondage for disobedience? For not listening to the Lord and what He told them about rest in the land, not not following Him, and He finally had to send uh, Nebuchadnezzar over to take the people, and and they they had taken them to uh, Iraq, what we know as Babylon, and so this psalm is intended to make Israel think about what had happened before, and I think it's for us too, because often. Um, Remember the old slogan, you never know what you had till you lost it? That's kind of what this song is about. It's about remembering what you had before you lost it. And hopefully you won't neglect what you have now and lose what you have now. So it says, by the rivers of Babylon, so of course they're in Babylon, there we sat down, and this is speaking about Israel, there we sat down, yes, and we wept when we remembered Zion or Jerusalem, when we were mindful and the memory, I found it interesting that, you know, when we think about stuff and we remember things of the past and things that we messed up on, he said, you know what, we cried. We cried because we remembered Jerusalem. Why? Because they were no longer there. And God was going to take them away for 70 years. And so they were thinking about that. He says, we hung our harps upon the willow, the willow trees in the midst of it. The willows, the harp was, you know, the music. Israel was always big on music, big on worshiping the Lord. The Psalms talk about all the different instruments that they use to worship and praise the Lord. But they couldn't, so they they hung their harps on the willow tree. Now, verse 1 and 2 are interesting, right? The willow tree is what kind of a tree? A weeping tree, right? In verse 1 it says, we wept. And then in verse 2 it says, we hung the harps on the willow tree. Pastor Chuck said he thinks that's where we got the name, the weeping willow. <laughs> I go, oh, that's kind of interesting. Because I've always known of the willow tree as the weeping willow. And here it says, one, we wept. Verse 2, we put our harps on the, on the, on the willow tree. By the way, that's the name Salcedo, just so you know. Uh, verse 3 says, For there were those who carried us, for there those who carried us away captive asked of us a song, and those who plundered us requested mirth, saying, Sing as one of the songs of Zion. So, you know, they knew that Israel was a worshiping people. And so the enemies, the Babylonians, say, hey, you guys sing us a song from Israel. The song that you worship God with. 
Verse 4, he says, How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? No, this is not something we can do. If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forsake its skill, or let me not be able to play. If I do not remember you, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth, so, you know, another, so, I, so I cannot sing. If I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy. So the idea is here is that there's no way we're going to sing to our enemies the songs of God, the worship songs. It wouldn't be right. And, and unfortunately, we still see that today. We see worship songs being sung by the world in a setting that is not godly and using the Christ songs to produce or promote what they're doing. And, and Israel, Israel says, you know what, we're not going to do that. We're not going to let the world come in and our enemies come in and ask us to play. We're not going to play. If I was to do that, I would rather not be able to sing. I'd rather my tongue glued to my mouth. And I couldn't do this. And then in verse 7, he says, or verse 6, at the end he says, If I do not exalt Jerusalem above all my chief joy, remember, O Lord, against the sons of Edom, the day of Jerusalem, who said, Arise, arise, arise it, rise it to its very foundation. The, the idea there was the Edomites, when Babylon came to conquer Jerusalem, they came and said, basically, destroy them, destroy them to their foundation. Now, remember who Edom is. Edom is from Esau. This is the actual brother of Jacob. So these are actual blood relatives saying, destroy my cousins. Kill them. And, and Israel saying here, God, remember what they did. O daughter of Babylon, who are to be destroyed, happy the one who repays you as you have served us. Happy the one who takes and dashes your little foot against the rock. So Babylon, now remember, Babylon was sent to Jerusalem by who? <clears throat> by God. God actually sent Nebuchadnezzar there to take them captive because of their disobedience. He was using a worldly king to chastise his own people and to take them to Babylon. The problem happened is that that Babylon took that and went extra and treated Israel bad. They, they're, uh, well, I can't even, I think Isaiah, I think Isaiah somewhere, it talks about them killing the children, raping the women, taking advantage of Israel. Isaiah writes about that. So they went way beyond what they were called to do, and that's why they were going to be judged and punished themselves. And so they're just saying, Lord, remember what what uh, the Edomites did, and remember what ba Babylon did, and avenge us for what they're doing. In chapter 138, uh, this is the Lord's uh, goodness to his faithfulness. This psalm of God is a prayer because of his faithfulness. He says, I will praise you with my whole heart before the gods. I will sing praises to you. So in this one, we talked about this last week. Praise should always come from the heart. It should never be uh, without serious thought. Without serious thought. Now you can, you each have to decide for you what is true praise and worship. Like for me, I don't normally listen to worship music on my car radio or like, I don't want to name the radio station, but I don't listen to Christian music in my car when I'm driving as backup music. You know, I'm driving, I'm just going to put it on and, and kind of listen and, and just drive and do what I'm doing. I never do that. It's not my nature to do that. Since the very beginning, since the very first time I got saved, I had decided, because uh, I had it on, I go, you know what, it's just backup noise. And I said, Lord, no, I'm not going to do that. And for 30 some odd years, when I turn my radio on and listen to worship, it's because I want to hear worship. But it's not there just to pass my time. Let, let me put it to you that way. That's for me. I don't know what yours is. Because I didn't know this verse at that time. I just knew what the Lord had shown me. I will praise you with my whole heart. That's the idea. My whole heart has to be into it. I want to focus 
on God when I'm doing worship. He says, and before the gods, this is the word Elohim. It, it's the judges that God has appointed. He says, I will sing praises to you. So before the world, before the rulers of this world, I am going to praise you. I will worship towards your holy mountain and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. So no matter where I am, no matter what's going on in my life, I'm going to worship towards your, the direction of your holy mountain. That's why the Jews today, when they turn to pray, they always face east towards Jerusalem. And they pray towards the holy mountain of God. And you know, it's a good reminder to us to always pray to the Lord. Of course, we look up to heaven for our praise to God. Uh, in verse, it says, For you have magnified your word above all your name. Uh, God's word, uh, the idea is, is God's word is to be exalted. Not because God's name is invaluable, but God honors his word. And what he's saying is, I am going to honor your word. I'm going to exalt your word. I, I listen to your word. I'm going to live your word. And I'm going to exalt your, your word uh, above your name. In the day when I cried out, you answered me. I, I like that verse. That's the highlighted verse. In the day that I cried out, you answered me. You know the problem with us and people in general? We don't want to cry out to the Lord. And God can't answer us if we don't cry out. We have to call out to Him. We have to look up like Moses when he finally hit the, the you know, place of nowhere to go. God says, I finally got you, but you got to cry out. And He says, that in the day that I cried out, you answered me and made me bold with strength in my soul. I was so encouraged, I became strong. The answered prayer that God had brought him, it strengthened him. All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord, as in Yahweh, Jehovah, the self-existing one, or the eternal one. Remember, uh, the word uh, God isn't mentioned by the Jews. The YHWH is, is Yahweh, it's, it's the Hebrew word, uh, uh, letters that they would say, and so they would, they would uh, uh, Put in like in Yahweh, you have the uh, the Y H W H. You have the A in between the Y and H, and then E between the W and H. So it's Yahweh, but it's actually Yahweh because the Jews, God's name was so holy, they wouldn't say the name. I've heard many articles and listened to many tapes that when they would transcribe these words with the word Lord, every time they came to the word Lord, they would take a shower. They would rebathe and get re-cleansed again because they, the name was so sacred. Uh, we truly miss that today in our culture. The, the Lord's name being uh, worthy and reverence, you know. It's used often in profanity and, and without any type of respect. But not the Jews, man, especially these writers. They, they knew who God was. They knew He was self-existent, eternal. It was the name was special. He says, "Yes, verse five. They shall sing of the ways of the Lord, of, of the way of Yahweh or Jehovah, for God is the glory of the Lord. For great is the glory of Jehovah, the Lord." And notice all the Jehovahs. Through Jehovah, through the Lord is on though, though through the Lord is on high. Yet He regards the lonely. But the proud he knows from afar. It, it's interesting. Uh, when you're humble, God is close to us. But but notice the proud, he's from afar. They're, they're too far away. Their pride separates them. Like Satan's pride caused him to fall to the earth. And God cast him off. It took him away from the presence of God. Same idea. When the proud is in, involved, he says, they're too far. They're far away from me. Though the Lord is on high, verse 6, yet he regards the lonely, but the proud knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, here's another good verse. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. You will come for me, restore me, care for me. You will stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand will save me. So, you know, again, God's care and watching over his people. The Lord Yahweh or Jehovah will protect, perfect, 
that which concerns me. No, you got to like that. You got to like that. God cares about us. He's, he's going to watch over us. He's, whatever concerns me, he's involved with. Your mercy, O Lord, your, or Jehovah, endures forever. Do not forsake the works of your hands. And man is created by God, starting with Adam. And everyone born from Adam and Eve is a part of the creation of God. I read an article just today. It was really interesting. I, I should have wrote the verse that they were um, using. But it said that when you look at this verse, uh, the Lord will perfect that which concerns me. Your mercy, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the works of your hand. That every single uh newborn baby is crafted by God during that nine month period of the cycle of birth God, the hands of God are performing the uh, development of that child and so when someone aborts a baby that's why they're in certain stages they they've stopped the hand of God from his creation tell me they're not going to be judged for that I thought, that's a mind blower. That's a mind blower. God is, his hands create us. God is at work in every single person's life. Lord, do not forsake the works of your hands. That's us. Don't abandon us. I always think of the verse about where God will always finish what he starts. Philippians 1 16 being confident of being confident of this very thing that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ God's not finished with this guys he's still working on us he's still molding and shaping what is the, the Bible say I forget maybe Jeremiah God says I am the potter and you are the clay and he's forming and shaping and molding and making us into that image that he wants us to be. So don't give up on your husbands or your wives or yourself. God's not done with you. He's still working with you and I. He's still purging out those impurities in our lives when we blow up or get angry or, uh, you know, cuss or whatever. Cussing, terrible thing. But you know what? Because our culture is 67, I think it's 67 or 76 percent normally cuss and on everyday in everyday language. We need God's help to remind us we can't blend in with the culture. We need God's help to say, Lord, you gotta help me with that. Help my mind to be renewed so I don't say these foul words, because they're in everything. You can rent a G movie and you're gonna find a foul word. It's it's just normal for this world in our country. And but God's not done. He, he's going to finish what he started. And he's going to, he, we're going to be complete, mature in him. Father, we are so grateful for your mercy in our lives. We're grateful that you are not done with us. We're grateful that this song reminds us of your blessing in the life of every single human being that you have created, that you are have molded, you have shaped. Uh, I forget that verse, but Lord, is that I am wonder, wonderfully and, and beautifully made by you, Lord. Whatever that means, whatever that might look like, we are all a part of your creation. And you're going to watch over your people. You're going to care for your people. Lord, even right now, even right now, Lord, this is a, such a good reminder to myself to myself and my own insecurities and my own weaknesses and my own doubts and frustration, Lord, that you are in charge and you are watching over everything and you're going to provide everything and you're going to take care of those enemies that come after us and come after me, Lord, and you're going to protect us and watch over us, Lord, because you loved us and you have a plan for us. We're so grateful for this portion. I know I am tonight, Lord. Thank you so much, Father. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Let's stand together. <clears throat>
Children say 